every year, there are up to 100 shark attacks worldwide. Those who come face to face with the ultimate predator rarely escape unscathed. Understanding how and why they attack is our only chance of surviving this natural born killer. As more and more of us take to the water, shark attacks are on the increase. I have never seen anything in all my life such a savage attack. It feels like I got hit by a car, because when it hits you, it doesn't even slow the shark down, it's just going full speed. But can we predict their behavior and avoid their attack? Pull down their side fins or pectoral fins, they arch their back, they move their jaw up and down, showing their teeth. And if you come too close, they'll, they'll strike you. Who do they attack? Where do they attack? And can we protect ourselves? Cape Town on the southwest tip of South Africa. Its coastline pounded by the planet's most violent sea. Here, the Indian Ocean meets the Atlantic, creating the notorious Cape of Good Hope, feared by mariners worldwide. But beneath the waves lies a greater danger. There are over 350 different species of shark that patrol our seas. But three are especially dangerous to man. The bull, the tiger, and perhaps the most feared of all, the great white. Growing to over 20 feet in length and weighing over three tons, great whites have few enemies. But despite their formidable power, one man risks life and limb to understand their behavior better. Craig Ferreira has been fascinated with the behavior of the great white for nearly all of his 33 years. We've taken quite a keen interest in white shark attack on humans. And we want to explore this further and try and see if we can really learn enough about the white shark's interactions with humans that we can, we can provide positive input or really substantial information to the general public that use the oceans because people really don't know anything about these animals. Already a veteran of cage diving, Craig's planning to push the envelope even further. He wants to dive with the great white unprotected to study how they react to humans in open water. He's heading for a stretch of sea known as Shark Alley, 10 miles off the southerly tip of Cape Town. This is prime great white hunting territory. Craig baits the water with blood, fish oil, and tuna. It's an irresistible cocktail for a great white. Within 10 minutes, a great white appears. Its hypersensitive nose has picked up the scent. Before Craig will get into the water and risk his life, he must tempt the shark onto the bait and check out how aggressive it is. The 
shark moves in there and he just gives up the wrong vibes. He gives up the wrong body language. If he really goes nuts on the bait, then you've got to be very careful about that shark. But then there's other days where the sharks look fine to me, but I, f I don't feel good and I feel nervous and apprehensive. And then I'll jump in the water and I'll see how I feel. And I've gone into the water and suddenly I felt completely calm. Craig's decided that the shark is calm enough to free dive with. He wants to observe its behavior toward him in open water without the protection of dive cage bars. It's a high risk experiment. What you've got to remember when diving with them is that these animals take out huge seals. They take out other large sharks. They eat and kill big sharks. So a human being out in the water with one of them, if that shark decides to do something, you've got absolutely no chance at all. So the risk is very high. And obviously, as a result of a high risk, you do have close encounters. It's too dangerous for Craig to dive alone. He'll be taking two colleagues as lookouts. But has Craig misjudged how aggressive the great white is? Before he's even gotten into the water, the shark takes a bite at his fin. I'll go into the water and I'll see how I feel with the shark down there. Because the shark may change its behavior completely once I enter the water. Then my heart's been pumping and the shark's off feisty and I realize I've got to be very careful and I stay close to the boat. If anything goes wrong, a single pole is all the team will have to defend themselves. This is a 16-foot, fully-grown female. She's an intelligent hunter and picks her prey carefully. She didn't get to this size by being reckless or too timid. At first, she's wary, circling, checking the team out. This is all part of the ritual. Slowly, she starts to edge closer, and suddenly her behavior dramatically changes. As the great white approaches, her pectoral fins drop into the attack position. Craig knows he must not panic, or the shark will attack. When you're in the water with a white shark, and this animal's coming at you, and you can't leave the water you know, immediately, like instantly. The most important thing is to stand your ground and maintain eye contact. And that's the most dangerous thing because your mind's telling you to turn around and get out the water, but that, that is the fatal mistake. Craig feels the great white is getting too aggressive. He tells the other two team members to get out leaving himself stranded in the water. What I am learning is that, first of all, they are predictable. But the fact that we can actually go into the water and dive with them safely and look at them and then decide to do it tells us that they are predictable. In that perspective, we're learning how these sharks interact with human beings and how they behave as well. And hopefully later on that will help us to, to help other people, or teach other people how to safely coexist with sharks as such in the water. We may not yet understand how and why an attack may happen, but for the shark, it's pure instinct. Come on, baby. On the other side of the world, on the west coast of Australia, a group of swimmers' confrontation with a great white was a surprise attack and revealed how selective a shark can be when choosing its prey. Diane McCusker, Anne Vincent, and Jerry Venturis 
were all members of a local swimming group called the Pod. And with them was businessman Ken Crew. Every morning we come down between, oh... 6, 6, 6.30. Yes. Yeah. And there's probably, on most mornings, between five or eight of us that swim. The morning of November 6, 2000, started like any other. The pod met on the beach for their usual 6.30 swim. It was quite misty and we just walked up the beach as usual, chatting away. Uh, we got into the water and um, the visibility wasn't very good that day. And we just did our usual swim from a place that we call Peter's Pool, which is a little break in the reef. Kim made the comment, I thought I saw something out there. And um, I think they just discounted it as being yeah. just probably a seal, seal or, or something. We decided we'd sprint to uh, have a bit of a sw uh, swim. We finally got to the North Cauliflower Beach and uh, we stood there about chest deep in water. When we finished the swim, we were just sitting around chatting uh, in the water, treading water, and I decided to swim on to the next reef. And that's when all of a sudden somebody yelled out, shark, get out of the water. The swimmers at Cottesloe Beach fled for their lives. I mean, people were rushing underwater. Some ladies were getting hysterical. Men were shouting. I stopped swimming and looked up, and uh, there were. I noticed everyone was on the beach, and there was nobody in the water. And I turned to my right, and of course, I saw the huge pool of blood, and I realised immediately what had happened. The picture I had in my mind was. Ken swimming a full-blooded freestyle and this huge shark. And the shark seemed to sort of rear up out of the water in the same forward motion, take Ken in its jaws. just shake him and drop him and drop him this photograph taken seconds after the attack shows Ken crew being dragged from the water the great white is only feet from the swimmers it was just for that Mayhem. awful awful minute horrific I have never seen anything in all my life uh, and I've seen plenty of sharks up in the Northwest such a savage attack When we arrived, there was a, a lot of people running around on the beach, um, and there was obviously a, a degree of not um, panic wouldn't be the right word, but certainly there was a degree of emotional turmoil. From the point where the shark had attacked, he had trauma to the lower half of his body and legs um, that was very significant, and effectively he had lost um, enough blood to to have not not enough left to sustain life. Ken Crew's injuries were massive. The shark had bitten off his right leg, slicing through a major artery. He'd bled to death in seconds. The shark was later videoed from a Coast Guard helicopter before it swam out to the deep ocean. How and why did the shark single out Ken Crew in the middle of such a large group of swimmers. In the attack uh, in Australia, my feeling is these, the shark was patrolling the shore, close to shore, and it was using primarily vision, 
White sharks have these huge muscles associated with their eyes, and they're moving their eyes around, scanning the surface or scanning the shoreline. And there they saw some objects, and this shark made a dash, seized one object. So it's probably visual, the, uh, that attack. Something about the movement and position of Ken Crew made him more vulnerable than the other swimmers. It watched him from a few hundred yards offshore. The great white's eye has better color vision than any other shark. It's this hunter's greatest asset. It can stalk its prey from above the water's surface, picking the moment to close in and strike. As it approaches, it rolls its eyes back into their sockets. Now attacking blind, the great white switches to electro detection. Now, as the shark gets really close, it may be using its electrosensory organs, which detect these electrical fields. And the human body has all these electrolytes, and our breathing creates these electrical fields that the shark could detect really close. Sensitive capillaries on the snout can detect currents as low as one five billionth of a volt. In the attack on Ken Crew, the electrical activity from his beating heart was enough for the shark to home in on. Under the threat of such a supreme predator, is there anything that can be done to protect the shoreline of Cottesloe Beach against future attacks? The answer may lie 9,000 miles away in Durban on South Africa's eastern coast. Known as KwaZulu-Natal, this is the country's number one tourist attraction. Every year, tens of thousands of people are drawn to the warm waters and the big surf of the Indian Ocean. But behind the beauty, lies one of the worst shark attack records in the world. If you're not sure why KwaZulu-Natal has had such a bad history of shark attack, what we do know is that the, the three most dangerous species in coastal waters worldwide are the Zambezi, or bull shark as it's known internationally, the tiger shark, and the great white. And all three of those species are relatively common in our waters. Durban's problem with shark attacks increased after the Second World War. Over a period of six years, the beaches witnessed 21 attacks, seven of them fatal. December 1957 saw the shark attacks reach an all-time high. On unprotected beaches, Vacationers witnessed the horror of five people being eaten alive by sharks. In response to public outrage, the authorities were forced to put in protection. Teams of helicopters dropped miles of netting anchored a few hundred yards offshore. Forty years later, this still remains the first line of defense for Durban's beaches. Over 30 miles of netting provide near-safe bathing at 60 beaches along the shark-infested waters of KwaZulu-Natal. Shark netting is a very labor-intensive exercise. You have to continually service the nets to make sure that they're clean. But if you leave those nets for more than maybe only two weeks in summer, they get so much growth on them that they, they no longer catch sharks. The nets work by appearing invisible underwater. If too much marine growth builds up on the mesh, then the sharks will see the barrier and avoid being caught. And catching the sharks is essential. Since the nets were installed, the KwaZulu-Natal coastline has only seen two fatalities and keeping it this safe is a full-time job. Yet 
Using high-powered boats, a team of 180 serviced the nets continually year-round. Most of the nets are over 200 yards long and anchored in nearly 40 feet of water. They don't form a continuous barrier. Instead, they're laid in a staggered overlapping pattern. The shark nets function. They do provide some sort of a physical barrier whereby the sharks are kept on the outside and the people can swim on the inside. But the nets are not a complete barrier. We know that the sharks move in and out of the nets, particularly at night. And any shark that spends a lot of time close inshore in the vicinity of the swimming area has got a very good chance of being caught. It's 6 a.m. and this early morning team is checking the nets just 300 yards off Durban's main beach before swimmers and surfers arrive for the day. There's already been an overnight catch. This is a six-foot hammerhead shark and could be dangerous to swimmers. It hasn't survived and is destined to be used for research back at the shark's board. If it had been alive, the crew would take it to deep water and return it to the ocean. The nets trap around 1,400 sharks every year, securing the safety of the beaches along South Africa's eastern coast. But for two months every year, the nets have to be lifted. During June and July, millions of sardines make their treacherous run up the eastern coast, hotly pursued by large numbers of hungry sharks. If the nets aren't taken out, thousands of sharks could be trapped in the mesh. The best way to get an early warning of the migrating sardines is for the shark sport team to try and spot them from a thousand feet up. Okay, I'm gonna turn now. Well, unfortunately, uh, the sardine season coincides with the holiday season um, in, in KwaZulu Natal. So we have uh, thousands of tourists coming down to the coast and uh, we sit piggy in the middle and uh, we have to try and balance between the environment and the requirements of the tourists. This is the closest the shark will get to fast food. The sardines pack together closely, forming enormous dark clouds. Easy targets for the frenzied sharks that feed among them. Swimming in these conditions would be suicidal, though unbelievably, some people still go into the water. But even with the nets back in the sea at the end of July, safety is never guaranteed. The shark nets will never ever provide 100% protection, but if you look at the shark attack record prior to the introduction of shark nets and you look at the, at the incidence of shark attack at netted beaches since nets were introduced, there's been a, a, a very marked uh, decrease in the incidence of shark attack. Thousands of swimmers and surfers enjoy the protection of the nets in Durban every year. But South Africa is not the only place with a treacherous coastline. Across the world, there are 14 shark attack hotspots, danger zones where people are at greatest risk. As our fascination with using the sea for leisure increases, so do the number of attacks. And 98 of them have happened here, in the warm tropical waters of Hawaii. With the shark's acute hearing and keen eyesight scanning the surface, people splashing in the water make an easy target. Three years ago, housewife Lori Boyette decided to take the long trip from Rhode Island to Kona, Hawaii for a family vacation. We went to Hawaii in 1998 um, at my father's invitation. He was turning 80 years old and all of my brothers and sisters were going to be there with my nieces and nephews. So there'd be 20 members of our family at Kona Village. Well, it was about five o'clock on the November 23rd, Tuesday. 
and I had wanted to go to these buoys that were about 150 yards off offshore. My nephew Jeff said, Lori, do you want to swim to the buoys? And the beach was empty. And I jumped at the opportunity because he wasn't always free to do something with his aunt. I actually had a premonition that if there was a shark, this is where it would be. And I was, at that point, I was a little bit past a raft, which was maybe 150 yards out. And I thought that was a very, very strange thought to have, but it didn't scare me. I just wondered where it came from. As Lori approached the buoys, her premonition became a reality. I was hit from the, from the backside and knocked out of the water. The actual bite itself was excruciating. And the only way I can describe it is to say that when you have a piece of glass in your finger, it's, it, you're very uncomfortable. Well, you can imagine having a thousand pieces of glass in your backside. As she struggled to push the tiger shark away, her hands tore against the razor sharp serrated teeth. And then I raised my hands up in front of my face and I saw pieces of flesh hanging down to my palms. Drifting in and out of consciousness, Lori was taken to the shore where she waited to be airlifted to Kona Hospital. As she was rushed into the ER, the shark bite specialist was standing by. When she arrived here, she was in shock. She was hysterical. Um, she was not aware of all of her injuries. Let's take a look at these hands and see what we got. The only thing I remember in that ER is someone saying, we can't get her rings off, we can't get her rings off. And I was upset that, that in the process of cutting my rings off, they might cut my finger off. <laughs> my finger really was pretty messed up to begin with. Although Lori's hands had only been in contact with the teeth for a second, the damage was enormous. Flesh was torn from the bone. Nerves and tendons were shredded. These uh, shark bite injuries are unique. Basically, the teeth go into the shark's mouth so that when the shark bites a patient, the injury that's underneath the skin is usually in a different position than where the laceration is. In shark bite injuries, if you look at my hand, um, if the hand has gone into the mouth, the laceration will be here, but the injury will be distal to this. So in order to fix these injuries, you, and it doesn't matter if it's on your leg or your hand or wherever it is, but, and depending on the length of the shark's teeth, in order to fix these injuries, you have to open the skin ab above the area where the laceration is in order to get to the part that's damaged. We need to look at her back, Mike. Okay, what's three, ready? One, okay, okay, yeah. two, three. But nothing could prepare them for the full horror of her injuries. What's our pressure? Okay. Did we get, where's that Foley? We found a large, uh, her right buttocks was missing, uh, maybe uh, somewhere in the area of 14 to 16 inches diameter uh, defect in her right leg and right buttock. We also saw teeth marks, which were three quarters of an inch um, in width. That's good, that's good, that's good, that's okay. good. Let's get some clamps on here. Okay. All right, Here. All right. Let's call the crew. Let's get some blood up. Saving Lori's life was a race against time. The first stage was to stop the bleeding. The shark's teeth had sliced through arteries and she needed over 20 pints of blood just to keep her alive. Her major injury was her right buttocks, which the muscle had been removed. And that is too large of an area to be able to what we call swing a flap or cover it in any way. So for this part of the injury, we basically stopped the bleeding, which means we got rid of the dead muscle and all the, all the tissue that wasn't living because of the injury. We closed as much of the skin uh, on her leg as we could, primarily. And then after the surgery, 
um, we put something called a wound vac on the patient, which is a piece of foam rubber and a suction device, which promotes this granulation tissue. After wearing the wound vac for just two weeks, new tissue had grown over Lori's right buttock. Three years later, she's made a full recovery. But like others who've come face to face with the ocean's greatest killer, Lori still bears the scars. Life has gotten back to normal, except that people will say to me, you know, well, are you all better? Have you recovered? And I have recovered, but my body will never be the way it was before the accident. You know, I do have certain limitations, and I have to remember them and, and work around them. My hands will never function the way they did initially, and my backside will never get any fatter than it is right now. And so that has put limitations on what I can do. Not a lot, not a lot, but it's, my body is missing parts, and they're never going to come back. But why did the shark attack her? Was it because she was swimming on the surface? or that women are at greater risk than men. One scientist is trying to understand who exactly is most in danger. Whether sharks can differentiate between men and women, um, we have no reason to think that they have the ability to do that. One of the questions is, you know, maybe sharks can detect a woman if she's menstruating. However, the amount of blood that could be emitted is so small that it's highly unlikely. Um, usually in cases where people are injured, there's a lot of blood in the water, and it's a much bigger signal for the shark. If you're in a situation that makes you look compromised, then you could be increasing your chances of a negative interaction. Surfers get attacked a lot. Well, one of the reasons why surfers might get attacked so often is they spend more time in the water than any other water user group. They spend more time in the bathers, divers, and windsurfers together. They spend a huge amount of time in the water. Like many teenagers who live on the island of Hawaii, Jesse Spencer spends hours in the ocean waiting for that next big breaker. On the afternoon of October 1st, 1999, he was at his favorite surf beach paddling into deep water. He was about to learn of a shark's attraction to movement on the surface and their readiness to have a quick taste. Like most shark attacks, Jesse Spencer's strike came out of the blue. I was laying there and I was looking towards my left at, over at my friend that just paddled out and then I just felt a big bump and as I was turning my head I was thinking maybe a turtle or another surfer but then I all at that instant I remembered the other surfers were really far away and I don't think a turtle can bump me that hard <laughs> so then I turned and then like I don't know I just kind of saw the shark pop up went over my arm and then I went underwater I could feel the, probably the tips of the teeth kind of sh pretty sharp. First touched my skin and then after that it just went through and I couldn't feel anything. As Jesse was rushed to Hawaii's Kona Hospital, a surgeon was standing by. When Jesse came in, I immediately realized that the limb was not being perfused, that the fingers uh, were cold and blue, and everything basically distal or away from the incision was not, didn't have a blood supply. Jesse was attacked by a tiger shark. And like most species, its teeth are perfectly adapted for cutting through tough skin and muscle. We have 370 or 80 species of sharks that feed in so many different ways. Some have teeth that are plate-like, some have teeth that are dagger-like, that are used for feeding on soft-bodied animals. Some have teeth that are serrated, like a steak knife, that are really good through cutting through leathery-like hide. What I always find is amazing in the animal attacks, especially the shark attacks, is the bone is relatively intact, but the flesh is stripped off of it, and 
uh, it's, it's just amazing how efficient it can pull that soft tissue away without damaging the bone. Jesse was bitten and let go. The shark didn't come back for a second bite. So why was he attacked? Was it a case of mistaken identity? There are a lot of theories as to why sharks might strike people on the surface, surfers, boogie boarders, swimmers, things like that. Um, and one of the theories is the mistaken identity theory. It wouldn't matter if it was a floating piece of cardboard or you know, a garbage can it, or a live turtle or a person. If the animal's motivated to feed, what's the risk in going up and taking a little taste? The bite left Jesse's arm so badly mutilated, it's still on the road to recovery. After two years, he still doesn't have full mobility. I don't have two perfectly good working hands to do everything, so, you know, I'm affected a lot. Um, it's a lot of things I need help with sometimes. Just real small things that you never realize could be such a hassle. Jesse's attack took place in open, deep water. He had no defense against the shark that struck him silently from below. But now, scientists are developing technology that we can use to protect ourselves. The inspiration for their ideas sprang from an unusual source. In 1965, one man was given the job to protect America's most valuable commodity, the Apollo astronauts. Throughout the 60s and 70s, NASA targeted a stretch of Pacific water near Midway Island, famed for its space capsule splashdowns. But it was also famous for being shark infested. Uh, they didn't want anything to interfere at that moment with the recovery of the Apollo program. Uh, with the astronauts returning, it was quite an investment. And if you had some hungry sharks suddenly appear in the area, that could dampen the recovery process. The men responsible for the safe return of the Apollo astronauts were a crack team of naval divers called SEALs. But NASA was worried. Under the gaze of millions of TV viewers, the last thing they wanted was their astronauts eaten alive by sharks as they made their triumphant return. They needed an anti-shark weapon that divers could carry on their recovery missions. So Bruce came up with an ingenious idea, a pressurized shark dart. This bottle is filled with carbon dioxide gas. It's about 180 gram. I'm inserting into the cartridge into the chamber and seat it. Now this is armed and ready to be used. This is a sling. You bring it up here and hold it. You swim up to the shark and you strike. And as you release, then this launches like a slingshot forward with great velocity and strikes the shark. Uh, the gas then ejects under high pressure down this hollow needle and blows out into the body cavity of the shark. Uh, this, ghastly enough, ends up blowing the stomach of the shark completely out of his mouth in seconds. And of course, the shark can't breathe. The stomach is over his gills, and he'll expire due to lack of oxygen. Bruce's pressurized dart was successfully used right up to the end of the Apollo program. But the pursuit of the ultimate shark deterrent continued. When the moonshot program ended, the military's priorities turned to jet fighter pilots. A number of unusual concepts were put forward, 
some more successful than others. Colored ink was meant to obscure the pilot behind a dense cloud, except the sea currents swept the defense away in seconds. A wall of air bubbles was supposed to deter a shark from crossing, but it only worked on one specific species. Most just swam straight through. But out of the countless failures came one successful idea. Developed by a former nuclear scientist, the body bag wrapped the person in a protective polythene shield. It was small enough to fit into a flight suit, and once in the water, a pilot could crawl inside and inflate flotation rings around the rim. Below the surface, it protects limbs and holds in body fluids like blood and urine that can attract sharks. One group today that also needs a deterrent is scuba divers. This brief encounter with a shark nearly cost this woman her leg. The razor sharp teeth left a gash needing 19 stitches. The scuba diving world is clearly ready for its own anti-shark deterrent. Wildlife photographers Ron and Valerie Taylor spend a lot of time in the water with some of the most dangerous species of sharks in the world. Fifteen years ago, they started experimenting with a repellent that used electrical shocks to ward off the threat of a shark attack. The Taylor's first early trials look promising. Like all good ideas, the principle is simple. A crude loop of electric wire that passes an electric current into the water. As the shark approaches, she turns on the power and it immediately veers away. Harmless to both shark and diver, the device clearly works. Using the success of the early trials, Paul von Blerk has spent the last 12 years developing and testing the shark pod. The main part of the unit is attached to the air tank. It houses the battery and an electrode that passes an electric current to a base plate fixed to the fin. The whole device is operated from a switch held in the diver's hand. When he turns shark pod on, a current flows between the two electrodes surrounding his body in an invisible electric shield. The charge is so low that it doesn't affect the diver, but to the shark, which can detect currents as low as one five billionth of a volt, it's far too painful to get close. And with up to 100 attacks and 10 deaths worldwide a year, protecting ourselves is becoming ever more important. Over the last few years, the largest increase in shark attacks has been along the eastern coast of America. In the summer of 2001, these beaches have witnessed sharks moving into shallow waters and striking swimmers near the shoreline. There's two right there. Attention surface in the area. Just so you know, we have spotted several 101, several sharks. If you wish to remain in the water, you remain at your own risk. In just a few weeks, there have been 20 attacks and two deaths, often in water no more than three feet deep. Everyone wanted to know if it was because there were more people in the water or because the sharks were becoming more aggressive. We may never know the answer, but scientists from Cal State Long Beach believe we could reduce the number of attacks if we knew more about their feeding habits. 
This research could help us judge what times of the day it's most dangerous to get into shark-infested waters. The scientists spend their summers studying the sharks that live around Coconut Island in Hawaii. They're not convinced by the popular theory that they only feed at the beginning and end of the day. One of the most hotly contested questions in, in shark biology these days is when do sharks feed and how often do they need to feed? If people are being attacked because sharks are in a predatory mode, then understanding when sharks feed would be really important. How, however, there's very little scientific support for when many species feed. Like, for example, tiger sharks. Do they feed in the morning or at night or at dusk or dawn or any time they could come across a meal? Well, right now, we have no idea. So that's where a lot of the work that we're doing here may be so important. One way of determining when a shark might attack is to try and find out when it's hungry. Okay. Using this metal probe packed with microelectronics, they plan to look into the digestive habits of a shark. The shark's stomach contains acid that varies in concentration depending on how hungry they are. The weaker the strength, the bigger their appetite. They plan to feed the probe to a shark and record the times of the day when stomach acid levels are at their weakest. They'll then know when the shark is hungriest and most dangerous. But this probe is a big pill to swallow and calls for some crafty disguising. The plan is to use one of the shark's favorite delicacies. By gutting a squid and hiding the probe inside, they hope to fool the shark into swallowing it whole. What'll happen is within a couple hours or so, the, the outer part, the squid part, will be digested away, leaving the, the probe behind. And the idea there is that we can later go back and feed the animal again and again. So as the shark gets fed, the acidity will drop, and then it will rise as the meal gets digested, and then we feed it another meal, it'll drop again, and then slowly rise. So eventually, after four or five days, the shark will regurgitate the probe, and Yanni can collect it and download it, and we can see changes in acidity in the shark's stomach over time. This is the first stage in a long line of experiments that they'll be carrying out on the eating habits of the shark. The next step will be to develop a probe that can be fed to an animal in the wild. Then, by tracking and downloading data remotely, they'll be able to pinpoint exact feeding times on any shark. Hopefully, we'll be able to look at species like white sharks and tiger sharks and bull sharks, ones that have been responsible for attacks on humans, and maybe better advise people on, is it really unsafe to be in the water at night, or is that just a myth? There's still much to learn about the science of shark attacks. Those who've lived through the nightmare have drawn their own conclusions about when it's safe to swim. I think about it a lot more in the water, just, you know, being careful. I make sure I don't go out when it's rainy. I don't go out when it's too choppy or overcast. You know, I make sure it's pretty nice looking out there. Well, I will not swim in warm water anymore. I won't swim in Florida. I won't swim in Hawaii. I do swim in Rhode Island because the water's cooler, but I am very cautious and I'm very apprehensive when I step into the water. Science and technology may be able to help us, but one fact is certain. As more and more of us take to the water, the number of shark attacks is going to increase.